Okay, this one is not going to be about just costumes because not gonna lie and I say it with full responsibility of betraying Pride and Prejudice Persuasion is my favorite Austin book. There is just something about the idea of two people longing for each other but unable to say it or just this anxious type of feeling you have for someone that makes you doubt yourself that makes my heart sing. I don't know if you remember, but there were supposed to be two persuasions coming out, actually. One was a fun and quirky one, and then the other one was supposed to be with Sarah Snook playing Anne. Somewhere along the line, the Sarah Snook production got cancelled, and honestly, I kind of wish it was the other way around. Because this persuasion ain't it. <laughs> I know a lot of people complain about all the anachronisms, especially things like language, referring to modern ideas such as exes or playlists, costuming, but honestly I'm a huge fan of like spicing history up with modern twists. And I actually like when period dramas play with the idea of us relating to the characters despite the hundreds years of difference because too often we tend to imagine people from the past as some sort of emotional statues. So I am all for jokes like this and I think honestly apart from some erotic references here and there which I thought didn't get along with the morality of the period. Most of them did their job. They were funny without completely ruining the suspension of disbelief. No, my biggest problem with this adaptation is not that it was a mediocre movie, but that it completely disrespects <laughs> the two main characters. Like, what's the point of taking a beloved story and turning the characters into someone completely different. My main issue was with Anne herself. Anne Elliot, you already know who it is. The reason I love the book Anne so much is because as someone who spent a good portion of my life moderately shy and anxious about interacting with people, I could relate to her. I'm not at all like Anne, but there is a side of me that could relate to being an observer, to being passive sometimes, to being quiet despite having lots of things to say. The book Anne is kind and thoughtful to the point she's kind of getting screwed over by other people. She's kind of a pushover, only for her to have the best character development and glow up by the end of the book, when she finally learns her worth, learns to speak her mind, even when it doesn't align with the wishes of others, and decides to follow her heart. The problem with these sort of characters, and I get that, like, I write scripts sometimes, I know that it's hard, is that they're really problematic to write for screen. While the book offers an inside view of their brains and motives, the camera can't pick that all up. So scripts hate passive characters because the whole point of a protagonist is that they're supposed to push the plot forward and when they're just standing by and observing it's so much harder to make that script work. They try to overcome that in the movie by breaking the fourth wall and introducing a voiceover but I feel like we didn't really need any of that because the movie Anne hardly left us wondering what's going on inside her head. I feel like in terms of Jane Austen characters, it's also the case for Fanny from Mansfield Park. If you remember the 1999 Mansfield Park adaptation, Fanny was turned from a shy and delicate character to a Jane Austen wannabe, a fierce and passionate young writer. And like, no offense, but why? <laughs> like, if I wanted to watch a character like that, I'd turn on Emma or Pride and Prejudice. And also, why do we think that gentle and kind people can't be passionate? and interesting. I think that's also a problem there. Similarly to Mansfield Park, and from Netflix's adaptation of Persuasion, was spiced up to make her more interesting. Because of course someone shy and quiet is probably boring. And it was done by using some kind of pretentious tropes to be honest. Oh, she misses her ex, then she must scream in her pillow and she day drinks. Which by the way, can we stop pretending like overconsumption of alcohol is funny? I I have to say, Netflix's Anne had some embarrassingly not like other girls qualities. She has a pet rabbit, she's goofy, she plays with children because she doesn't care if her dress gets a little dirty, she makes awkward table speeches and snarky comments from time to time. Also, I swear to god, the bathtub immersion shot 
needs to die. I feel like it's the female equivalent to men smashing mirrors when they're upset in the movies. What is up with that? Have you ever done that when you're sad? What is it? I honestly, maybe I don't take baths often enough, but just like, why? There is just so many situations in the movie where I go like, Anne would never do that. <laughs> like in the beginning, she speculates about Frederick and how maybe he's been pining after her for all these years. Now, book Anne was full of doubt. She puts herself down a lot at the beginning of the story. Everyone around her has been commenting about how her looks are deteriorating and she's completely certain she's probably old and ugly. She knows she broke his heart and can't expect anything from him. So she's much more careful in being hopeful. Then, in a scene where she has to take care of the Musgrove's son, she is made to stay. When in the book, she offers it herself because she's too scared to even face Wentworth after all these years. Not to mention she gladly sacrifices herself for Mary all the time and Mary knows that and she uses it. It's another trope in the book that shows immense character development. So Anne is always willing to sacrifice her happiness for other people's happiness, which of course could be a noble trait as long as it doesn't negatively affect her own life. But by the end of it, she learns to say no when her boundaries are crossed. The film Anne quotes poetry from time to time and lectures Benwick about life. When he says, perhaps you're right, she says, I know I am. Like, girl. <laughs> in the book, she also talks to Benwick. They have the same conversation, but it has a completely different tone. It's, it's the delicate and compassionate words of advice for someone who is suffering. If the book Benwick said, perhaps you're right, Anne would probably say something in the likes of, well, I'm no philosopher and I could be wrong, but I do hope this helps a little. The book Anne was smart and intelligent, but she had no idea because no one safe from Wentworth ever approached appreciated that. The film Anne is also smart and intelligent, but she knows it. And it's a completely different vibe because like, where do you go from there? How can her character grow? My biggest WTF moment was when movie Wentworth said to Anne, you've never had any trouble speaking for yourself. And I was like, yes, she did. <laughs> like, that's literally what the story is about. If she had no trouble speaking for herself, y'all would be married. Like, it's the core of the story, which is about a gen Mental character learning from her mistakes, learning to speak up, right? If she never had any trouble speaking up for herself, then why the hell it all happened in the first place? There were other moments in the movie where they left a plot device from the book, but it completely didn't make sense considering the character changes. Like the opening scene where they told Anne they didn't have anything nice to write about her in the almanac. And I'm like, why? She's clearly out spoken and carries herself in a confident manner. Whereas in the book, it's a typical case of a person being overlooked because they're quiet and it's always assumed that they don't have anything interesting to say or that they don't have any opinions because they don't express them out loud. So the whole animosity between Anne's family and her was a miss for me because there were just no grounds for that. Like bullying feels different when a person you're bullying fights back. Anne's relationship with Mr. Elliot was also completely changed. The pivotal point of their relationship in the book is the moment Anne finds out about Mr. Elliot's true character from her childhood friend. And Anne being a person of high moral standards just cannot take him seriously anymore now that she knows his true motives. The movie Anne, on the other hand, appreciates his honesty and there's this flirting tension between them that book Anne would probably hate, especially that she didn't even know flirting existed. <laughs> and not gonna lie, considering the changes applied both to Anne and Mr. Elliot's characters, it probably works better for the movie. I actually like the dynamic. Generally speaking, it was refreshing to see Mr. Elliot portrayed as not a complete villain. He is a villain, but he kind of owns it, so it's a different vibe. And speaking of side characters, I also thought the characters of Mary Musgrove and Charles Musgrove were very nicely done and faithful to the book. But I hated the dynamic between Anne and the Musgrove sisters. In the book, they know each other well. They have been kind of like involved in the past. Charles Musgrove was supposed to marry Anne, but they still exist in different worlds. Musgroves are young, playful, 
full of energy and their lives evolve around finding themselves a man and they just want to have fun. The movie mask grows on the other hand. Uh, not only are they like besties with Anne, but they're both pretty mature for their age, I would say. Especially Louisa seems like she has some noble pursuits and life goals. Like she communicates with Anne to make sure she's okay with her pursuing Wentworth, which seems like a pretty grown-up thing to do or even notice. And speaking of which, this is a thing that completely ruined the movie for me and infuriated me throughout to no end because Everyone is supposedly shipping the main characters. Like, what is up with that? The whole charm of the situation featured in Persuasion is that it's two people longing for each other, suffering in silence, and nobody knows about it but them. In the book, only Anne's closest family and Lady Russell are aware of her past with Wentworth. And her family chooses to pretend they forgot. Nobody even knows there was something between them. Which is why I think it's so charming because as one of my favorite Jane Austen related memes say, it's all about longing and repressed desires. <laughs> and I mean it is. We're obsessing over pride and prejudice, not because Mr. Darcy publicly declared his love for Lizzie during the Netherfield Ball, or not because her sisters are trying to make her pursue him, but because it's something that just sort of hangs in there between them every time they speak. Something that only the two of them know about and everyone else has no idea it even exists. And it's the same in Persuasion. It's this constant game of trying to guess the other person's feelings. And as a reader, you feel so special to be allowed into that little world. So anytime someone in the movie makes a comment about it, Louisa telling Anne that she has to pursue him or Mary trying to encourage her her, or heck, even Captain Harville going like, mm -hmm. it honestly just ruins the mood for me and it just becomes cringy. It's like when a family friend brings a son that's your age and everyone is like winking at you and telling you to, to go for a walk. Like, the vibe is just not there. <laughs> so then, because of that, every time they do talk, it's super awkward because everyone's like, mm. From the first jam conversation, which is just awful to witness and the second-hand embarrassment is real, to the one-on-one -on -one confrontation that happens like 36 minutes in and also kind of ruins the tension between them. In the book, it builds throughout the book because they never bring up the past, they never bring up that topic until a certain point. Frederick is also being low-key mean and salty when in the book he was just distant and he was like overly polite, which I think is so much worse and more emotional to endure. When someone is bickering with you, at least there is some interaction and with every snarky comment, movie Wentworth just kind of confirms that he's not over Anne. Whereas in the book, he chooses to be very courteous and respectful towards her to the point where it kind of feels cold. And knowing how close they were before, it must have hurt like a mother tracker. That hurt like a butt cheek on a stick. Also, what was that beach conversation? What was it? Like, what the hell even was that? Trying to protect you again, my dude, what? Where did that come from? The cool thing about Anne is that for how gentle her character is, she's actually pretty fearless and cool-headed when facing big problems. There is this scene in the book when everyone is freaking out because Louisa fell and Anne is the one telling people, including Wentworth, what to do. She's like, you do this, you do that. We need to keep her head steady. Blah, 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 because she's the only one keeping her cool and it makes perfect sense within her character because even though she's rarely listened to when she tries to speak up her calmness is actually useful for other people when someone is trying to solve a problem and ask for advice they kind of take that for granted in a way and don't necessarily notice how much they rely and depend on Anne until a crisis like that happens and in the movie that scene was included but it didn't carry the same weight because throughout the movie nobody ever asked for her advice. It just came out of nowhere, like why is she the one keeping her cool? Like we didn't see that happen before. She was actually kind of panicky most of the time. I also hated the moment when they stumbled upon Mr. Elliot because it just seemed like such an unnecessarily toxic masculinity display, I don't know. Black, are you dumb? Are you getting rude to me? In the book it's a moment Frederick notices that other men see Anne and it, he just starts looking at her differently. 
In the movie, he's like this jealous ex that's not over you yet, and it seems a bit toxic, honestly. Apart from the intentional anachronisms that I think were supposed to be humorous, there is several moments in the movie where I feel like the creators completely misunderstood the period. First of all, I hate when movies try to spice up historical dances. Like, historical dancing is already perfectly hot, <laughs> as it is. In a world where skin-on-skin -skin contact was practically taboo, even something as simple as a turn or a glance can be really exciting. I think Joe Wright's Pride and Prejudice is iconic for understanding this. I mean, anyone watching the Netherfield Bowl scene can testify that there is incredibly intense chemistry there, and they're not even touching that much. Dancing to live classical music in a candlelit room is already romantic enough, like there is no need to make it physical. Second of all, Lady Russell's European tours. Um, I like Lady Russell in the movie. I think the character was portrayed well enough, but this trope just didn't work for me. Like, I think filmmakers really struggle to understand how different 19th century sexuality, especially female sexuality, was to the modern times. It was loaded with shame and consequences that could literally ruin you forever. Like, having lovers as an unmarried, even rich woman could make you lose everything you have. If anyone ever found out, it could get you banished from the society that you live in. It could make your whole family break contact with you. You could lose all your friends, people will refuse to do any business with you, you will not receive any help from anyone ever. Uh, basically, you would lead a solitary confinement-style life until the end of your days because you slept with someone once. So let me tell you, not many women back then would risk that, especially in the time where they didn't have any rights. And a person that was convinced that marrying the love of your life is risky because he's broke, probably wouldn't be going around risking her whole life for a little bit of fun. Like, not to mention Lady Russell, who was brought up in, in a small community and lived in a sheltered gentry town, would probably not even be aware you could take lovers. <laughs> okay, maybe that's too far, but who knows? There is also Louise's fall scene, and unlike previous adaptations, I think this scene was actually shot very well. Like, usually it looks kind of silly, because it's like, she just fell, like, why is everyone being so dramatic? But they brought the drama to this scene that I think was needed. But what followed completely ruined the tension for me, because in the very next scene, the doctor is like, Ah, she'll be fine. She'll live. Which is why then it makes completely no sense for me when they're like, we have to tell her parents the bad news. Like, what do you mean? Like, if it is bad, why didn't he say so? And if it isn't, shouldn't you be at least a little relieved? And finally, the giant octopus dream scene, which is like a rotten cherry on top of this whole persuasion cake. And I think it was an attempt at comedy, but it was just awfully written. In light of all the changes that took place in the movie, costumes were honestly not the worst part. I have to say because the color palette is toned down and the fabrics are quite plain, at least it all looks kind of cohesive. It's much less plastic than Bridgerton and I think the good tailoring of some pieces really kind of sells them. But yes, Anne looked completely modern. There's this scene at the beach where she walks into the water and her hair is loose and she's wearing this basic dress and it literally looks like something from a 2022 rom-com. Which, if you're watching a period drama, is not a vibe that you want to see. There is also this one weird outfit that she's wearing but it, where it kind of looks like she just has a modern shirt and a maxi skirt. And I mean, we don't watch period dramas for clothing that looks modern. Hell, I don't really understand why filmmakers think they need to constantly modernize and spice up period dramas. The sole reason we watch period dramas is to immerse ourselves in the past. We want clothing to look old. I don't get that. <laughs> Like, you can put some twists on it, but if I wanted to watch modern clothes, I would just put on a modern movie. And same goes for other elements of the of a period drama. Like, if you try to modernize it so bad, just make a modern movie, it'll be cheaper. But all this faints in comparison to the fact that Hollywood just hates gentle characters. And it's infuriating because I know for a fact there is a lot of viewers that 
are shy or observant or delicate or introverted that would love to see some representation on screen so when you already have a character like that a character which is beloved and is a classic piece of literature why oh why do you try to put some edge on it like some characters don't need edge they're perfectly fine being soft um on that note <laughs> Yeah, that's all. I'm just, I'm still waiting for a good persuasion adaptation because that book is honestly so good. I think I'm gonna give it another read. Just probably the 50th time.